everyone. Hi. Good morning. I already recognize somebody wearing one of Deborah's necklaces, Liz. Yes. I, I, I recognize that. Hey. Very nice. How are you? <laughs> So welcome, welcome everyone. Feel free to put your videos on and say hi now. Um, we're just gonna kind of keep it casual while everybody's coming in. And I don't know if anybody's got a handmade mug to share. I saw Judy's Ryan Ew. mug. This I is a pet uh, pilot. I found a mug. I got a handmade mug. Linda, is that Linda? Who who made your was mug? Cena. Yeah, Linda was seen. Linda's staff was with Cena. Handmade. Nice. Okay, cool. handmade. Okay, great. I have a handmade. Oh, handmade there we mug. go. Hi, Marsha. Is that one of yours? It's mine. Hello. Very nice. Thank oh. you. Anybody else want to say hi? Share your mug. Anything? Um, feel free to. Hi, I'm on. Shing. I'm hi. from uh, Massachusetts. It's my mug, and I don't remember the name of the artist, but I grew up so cool. in um, the Northwest Pacific Northwest. Oh, nice! Oh, I love beautiful. that. Nice. nice. Welcome everybody. Um, I'm Brian Ross. I'm the gallery director here at Peters Valley, and I am so glad that you can join us today. Um, so we're, you can leave your videos on, but we're going to ask that you mute yourselves so that we don't have any interference sound. Um, if you have questions for our guest today, who is Deborah Adelson from Collingswood, New Jersey, she'll be spotlighted in a minute, but, um, if you have questions for her, please put them in the chat. I will try to ask them in real time without interrupting her as we go along. So please keep the questions coming. It makes it a really um, dynamic presentation or event or whatever you want to call this. So um, please do that. And I guess we'll just hand it over. So Deborah's going to show us around her studio, I think, to start. And um, sure. welcome. Hi. So I am Deborah. Most of you that are on here, I think I know I've, almost everybody. Um, this is my studio. This is my bench. I'm just going to pan you over to where I solder my little soldering area. This is, I'm sitting at my bench right now. Um, I've all, I, I actually just organized. Um, I had a little flood in my studio a few weeks ago. And so it made me organize everything. Um, but I, my studio kind of spans around the space. I have a, a separate workspace and you can kind of see up above, I have all of these little trays on the wall. Those are all started projects, different. Um, when, I, when I work, I like to lay things out on a little cookie sheet and that way it keeps that whole thing together. And I kind of jump around from project to project. They don't generally do one thing start to finish. Um, so I'm going to just take you off of my little stand and I'm going to walk you around my studio. I have shelves and shelves of started pieces of glass and gemstones, lots and lots of little trays. These are all, all of those are uncut stones or gemstones. You know what? I'm going to bring you over here back to my soldering area. This is where all of the actual, oops, lost my torch. All of the actual little, uh, I don't know if you can see all the little trays of stones. I've got drawers and drawers and drawers of these. And then if you walk around, I'll do a little 360. This is where I do my polishing of sterling. And I, I keep it to the other side of the room because I highly polish everything and it creates a lot of dust, a lot, lot, lot of dust. And so you can kind of see I have curtains and when I'm doing a lot of polishing, I'll actually curtain that whole area off so that it keeps the dust in the rest of my studio kind of down to a minimum. So this is my jewelry studio. I also work in a, a cold working studio that's for glass. Um, which is in another, I'd have to go outside and into another building um, that I share that with my husband. He's also a glass uh, sculptor. And so a lot of the glass work that I do, a lot of the big parts of the glass, cutting the, uh, a, a big block of glass, I'll do in his studio uh, because that has a, raises a lot of silica in the air and um, it's not good to breathe. So I have one little tile saw, one little wet diamond saw that I have here in my studio. Um, the rest of the glass work I, I tend to do in the other studio. So this is all for jewelry. 
So, so do you find that you're questions. going back and forth a lot or do you I do? Yeah, I do. Um, I actually wear, <laughs> I, I buried it behind a curtain, but I wear a rubber apron when I work and rubber boots, like, like rain. I look like the Gorton fisherman when I'm doing glass work um, because the glass has to be wet and all the machines are wet and it, they, it splashes up at you. And so I get covered in, in water, dirty water. Um, but I'm running back and forth from studio to studio. A lot of the, most of the time when I work with glass, I do glass some days and I do jewelry some days, but when I'm setting and when I'm getting to the end part and I want everything to fit perfectly, there's like a lot of running back and forth that happens. So any, any other questions? Any questions? I can keep asking questions all day, but. Just ask me questions. <laughs> Well, I don't know if everybody's familiar with Deborah's work. Um, so where she's right, actually, so you work with like gemstones, sterling mm -hmm. silver, and then cold worked glass. Yeah. So I have some raw pieces of glass. Somebody just asked how I cut the glass. I I could show you the saw. Um, I'm not going to turn the saw on because it is really, really, really loud. Um, but the raw glass, actually, I buy it. You can see this. This was a giant block. This was just the corner of it. Um, my husband, who also works with glass, I use a lot of his cutoffs from his pieces. So I'm recycling the pieces that aren't are too small for him, or uh, for some reason have um, that he cut away from the the larger piece. So this is what the the raw um, optical glass um, looks like. Somebody's asking me about shelves, but we'll yeah. get to that. Are they from Ikea? That's what I. The shelves are, uh, the pegboard is from Ikea. The shelves are actually um, pot holder, like pot lid oh, nice. holders that I've hung from hooks. Because otherwise, uh, and it, when I'm really busy in my studio, I will get these trays. I have like hundreds of trays. And at any given time, if I'm leading up to a show and I'm working on a series, um, I have trays and trays and trays of work that are stacked up and they're, they're everywhere. But um, I have like a little system of uh, priority, and you know, I use the silver ones for mostly for glass, and then the plasticky ones when I'm setting the stones. I, I have like a little system in my head that I know what I'm working on. Otherwise, there's it's like a free for all, which it is a free for all anyway. Um, there's a, a lot of them are started projects that I've abandoned and, and may never go back to, but. Uh, but sometimes you know you unearth things that you started working on and you abandon and then you're like oh my god why didn't i finish this and it's like you know a whole you have a whole new take on things so these little cookie trays are like the best thing i have them everywhere i, I think it's a brilliant idea i was actually just looking because i have this little like i'm looking i was looking at baker's racks with trays because i wanted a cart to work on the top surface but now that i see that i'm look i'm sitting here looking around my studio and going maybe i should just do that I, I, mean, was, really I was originally going to do baker's trays, but I, I prefer these little, these are, they're like half cookie sheets, mm -hmm. they're not the full one, um, because the big ones were like a waste of space. And this, what I usually do is I put a piece of paper on the bottom and that way I can draw on it and lay things out. And I also like need guidelines when I'm making something that I want it to, you know, my work is relatively asymmetric, but it has to work on the body. And so I do a lot of drawing and I, I like to be able to guide myself otherwise you know you you lose track of where you are in space you know you kind of can go off on a tangent of things so so anyone else have a question there was another question I, I i didn't read it yeah i'm not sure i think jeanette was just asking about the trays and the a pull out tray system I, oh, you, oh she was asking you know what it is you have another tray system i think that you showed us where you had like oh those were from idea those are from ikea those are supposed to be letter like paper trees mm -hmm. i have an array of, of different pull out things those white ones i'm gonna bring you back over there these are from ikea um these things is it these you're talking about these are all from ikea yeah. um then i have like clear ones that i uh, i think i i got these at the container store these are like real jewelers ones up here um that I, these ones i used to bring to shows um uh, i don't like them as much i actually I really like these ones these are from the container store too these little they're like just the right height for mm. the little um for gemstones 
and I have them all over. I'm, I love little drawers and containers and. All right, we've got some questions coming in. All right, so okay. Adele wants to know, glass or gemstone, which is your favorite to work with? Hmm. You know, I really don't think I have a favorite. I kind of go between whatever, um, wherever my mind is at that moment. You know, I really, I love, the thing that I, I that how I ended up doing what I do, I went to Tyler School of Art and I started off making tableware and I worked a lot with aluminum, anodized aluminum. So my work was always about color. And then from aluminum, once, once I graduated, started working on my own, I kind of found my way to plastic. And, um, and I worked with plastics for a lot of years. Um, but also I can incorporate bold areas of color in my work. Um, after I had my son, I decided to stop working with plastics altogether. The world had changed. The world view on things changed. Uh, we then knew about global warming. We knew at that point in time, you know, what plastics were doing to the environment. It was never a thought in my head before then. Um, but I had all this anxiety after having him about like what I was putting out into the world. And so I then searched for another material. And my husband, as I mentioned, he works with glass, a different type of glass, a different, his work has a different feel. But the glass actually made the most sense coming from working with luminous uh, colored aluminum has that luminosity to it, the color, but it has like a sheen and it's luminous. And then the acrylics that I was working with also was like bright colored. Um, the, the material itself is bright, but it also has like a luminosity. And so working with the glass was like the next natural step. So I love things that are brightly colored. Um, the glass that I use, I, I mixed in uh, a little bit of dichroic glass. This is like a, a little raw piece of dichroic glass. And so you can see that it has like an opalescence mm -hmm. that I, I combine with other, like you can see if I combine that with this color, I get a completely different color. So I stack and layer all these different pieces of glass together and I can control the color, but I, I love working with, I love working with color. And so that's, you know, I, I incorporate the gemstones because it, it allows me to incorporate another facet, another type of color, another um, luminous sparkly thing. I mean, I guess I'm, I am a, I grew up in the eighties. I like, you know, bright, <laughs> bright sparkly thing. <laughs> Okay, so Judy wants to know, um, wait, we've got to, let's see. Um, what do you use to carve the pieces of glass that are set into the piece? And do you then polish the glass gemstone? Do. Um, so a couple of things. I started off when I learned how to work with glass. I went up to Corning Museum School and I took a few different classes to just become comfortable with the glass and, and see what it could do. Um, and I started working with an engraving. I, one of the courses that really uh, made sense to me was engraving. Um, and so I actually have a real engraving machine that I used to work on. Um, a few years ago, the pulley broke, we took it apart. I had a problem with the motor and I started playing around with, instead of um, what an engraving machine is, it's almost like a jeweler's polishing machine. It just goes very slow. And I was able to take away material um, I was able to engrave it. Now I'm actually carving and I'm using my flex shaft to carve. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, I have, I have a, I don't know, can you see? I'm gonna move this over here. Yeah. All right. I take my bench pin off. And this, this is a, um, no, it's not on. I probably have it set the um, vacuum unplugged, but this actually sucks up all of the the dust and silica. So and it keep, protects my face. And so when I'm carving, I I have I hang. This is out of the picture. It's very classy. I'm just going to warn you. Um, a IV bag that I hang. This is needs to be fixed, and I fill it with water, and I put it. A 
like a bucket below me to catch the water. And that way the work, the glass stays wet. Wow. And, and so that's, and I just keep, I have like a big jug that I used to use. I find this works the best. This was like a modified version of what they do in Corning. Um, and I, I, that my hands are always like wet and pruny and, and, and soaked. And I have, you can see all the different, uh, all the different, these are all diamond wheels, um, different. I have stone wheels. I have all different um, types of grit and they have all, you know, there are some that are for, that you could use also for metal, but these are all ones that I mostly use for glass up here. Nice. So Linda was asking if you can, can you show us how you cut the glass with a design, but do you do that in the other studio? Uh, no, I, the big pieces I cut, I, I'm going to just show you, this is, I have glass all over it. This is a ring saw. Now, right now, I'm not going to turn it on because there's no water in it. I would have to, um, you can see I have this like little loose bucket because mm. it drains. Um, I would have to have water in it for it to turn it on or it's going to break instantly. Oh, that's a really terrible angle that I was just at. Um, and then my hands there. But you can see this is the, the saw that I use. I also have in my husband's studio, a big giant diamond saw uh, that also has, it's also water fed that I use. And that's what I, I, I could not cut something this big on that because the saw, it could, I could only be like maybe two and a half, three inches. Um, it would probably break the, all, all of the, the bearings inside from the heat of this. Uh, so I would need to use a bigger saw. But when I cut something like, like this is a piece of glass that I've laminated. So you can see this, I, it's just contact paper so that I don't scratch the, the surface of the back of the glass because that's dichroic glass. Um, and this is a piece, sometimes I, I put a little piece of metallic tape on the back so I can see what the color is gonna be when I set it into the um, into the metal, it, it like lets me see. Sometimes it's a, there's a drastic difference between what it looks like with the contact paper and the, so I always keep a little a little bit of the metallic tape on the back so that when I'm choosing the glass, I, I have an idea what it's gonna look like. So we have a couple of questions coming in about like when you're stacking them, are you use how are you laminating them? Do you use a glue or what do you- I use, uh, I laminate them with, a glue called Hextel, H-X-T-L. Um, it is a glue that was uh, made for the optical industry. So it's optically pure and it, um, it's sort of like a two-part epoxy, but it will never yellow. It's very precise and it's very expensive. So it, it's not something that like I mix in a big batch. I actually mix exactly what I need. Um, I do it in a vacuum chamber to get all the bubbles out. And then it takes 72 hours to cure. So it's a process in and of itself. And I generally do that in the other studio because I do it, I set it up and I shut the door and I don't go back for 72 hours. Um, and Judy wanted you to hold up one of those tools. I think one of the carving. One of the bits? Earlier. Like one of the... Is this what you're Yeah, that's what about? you wanted to see. Yeah. So it's just a diamond wheel. And why I have so many, my husband teases me about this because I buy them in a set and I only use certain profiles over and over and over again. And the, just like any other diamond tool, I don't know if anyone's ever used a diamond tool, the diamond wears off. And so I go through certain profiles faster than other profiles, like the, the, big giant fat ones i don't i don't really use as much i i tend to use like there's certain shapes of it that i use and then i have to chuck because it it wears off and then the others that came in that pack i have like a thousand you know and then i buy another pack because i want to not get them that. individually you can um it actually costs more money to buy them individually than it does yeah. to buy them in the pack so it's like well i might as well just have those someday i might want to really use those shapes too and you know it's funny you know, I go through phases of like, I use one shape, it's like my thing. And then I like, was like, hmm, wonder what the shape does. <laughs> I, I don't know, you know, so it's, it, it changes. 
and it, it doesn't make sense to not buy the multi pack, but I end up with a lot of some shapes and and also some shapes just by the nature of the shape it wears way faster. I always says her dentist gives her diamond bits. I have also gotten um, flex shaft bits from my dentist. So it's, my it's dentist will not dentist. give me anything. He's stingy. So <laughs> he won't give me anything. I think he wants oh. me to like give him something for it. <laughs> there you go. Um, Adele asks, how many hours do you roughly dedicate to come to complete a project, large or small, complex, et cetera? You know, I actually don't know. Um, and that's partly because when I start, well, I generally work in a series. So when I start the series, I start with like a lot of drawings and I tend to draw on, on loose leaf paper. Um, and that way, when I have one that I like, I can stick it in a tray underneath things and use it as my guide. Um, but it involves like, you can just see what's on my desk right now. You can see this tray. I'm gonna zoom in. There's like all of these pieces that I made that I then didn't use. So it's not that I necessarily spend so much time working on like one thing and I only make the exact thing that I'm gonna use. A lot of time, you know, because my work is not, um, it's, you know, I'm, it's more experimental. I don't consider myself a, uh, can't think of the word. I'm sorry, I'm totally blanking. Um, but I don't make the same thing over and over. So the idea, the concept of, of my own, of my work is to like make something new each time. So it involves yeah, you're not a making lot of production. You're more not making, making that was one, of, word. one of a kind. And you could word, have like a right. series, right? Where you're taking right. a design and kind of making similar things, but right. so not exactly like, copies. Just, just in the, you know, sometimes there are those magical moments where like, I realize something, wow, that's, uh, that's cool. And I'm going to develop that and it magically works that doesn't happen most of the time there's a lot of like a lot of experimenting that goes into each thing and then which is why i have so many trays because i kind of start with this and then i kind of move on to that and then it kind of spins to this and it spins to that i i have a general idea I, I my work is loosely based on images that i take in my own travels that my dad my my dad in his retirement has become um the nature photographer and so he takes a lot, he travels a lot, well, he used to travel a lot pre-COVID and take images. And then I would use his images of places and, you know, and so there's a definite, you know, I have a, a definite thought of what I'm trying to achieve. It's not random, but in order to come up with, I, I, I when I'm in my booth and people ask, I say, I try to come up with my own visual language for that place. And that's not always easy. Sometimes it takes me, you know, weeks to figure out like, what is it that I want to say about this place? Or how did it make me feel? And, and how are those lines and colors and all of those things going to come together? And so, you know, there's a lot of making and abandoning. Um, you know, I might come back to those things, but I don't know that I necessarily have like, I don't time myself. You know, I just kind of follow the path until it works. Do you, all those pieces that you showed us on that tray that you said didn't work, mm -hmm. will you now eventually maybe go back to those and use them or they're trash? Mm -hmm. No, I don't throw away anything. <laughs> like, I don't throw away anything. No, it'll, they'll become things. I mean, it, they were going to be smaller parts of a larger piece and, and maybe um, like this, like I remember like this little teardrop, I, it's totally usable. This little guy I made for mm -hmm. a piece. And then I decided I, I liked it facing the other way. Like it just made more sense in the design to like, flip flop it and so I was like all right I'm just going to recarve it but like you know once I once I figure out the idea it's it's much easier faster to go through and, and make something you know in the other direction um you know part of the time that I spend is is in the experimenting so and, and a lot of that experimenting is even just with the color like you know what pieces laying lay together to make the right color you know I, I kind of obsess over that stuff so people have some questions, but I have a question first. So I get to ask mine. Okay. <laughs> um, when you were showing us the wheels before, like, do uh -huh. you are there different ones that some are gonna, right? Some are carving away, or and I don't know if those are like the diamond bits that are kind of carving it away. But then, do you have other ones that you use that kind of clean up or polish 
the glasses, like the last. I do. Year. I also just use regular silicon carbide sandpaper a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. I use a lot of wet dry sandpaper. Mm -hmm. um, the like I use some stone like you know these are little where's my camera little stone wheels. Mm -hmm. um, these that will smooth it out. The diamond wheels take a lot of material away and they make a lot of like little chippies. So let me see if there's a piece around that has, like you can kind of see, I don't know if you'll be able to see it on camera. I'm sure I have something like here. This is a, uh, you can kind of see the, if I see how, see that sparkle, that's a chip. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So that's undesirable because it's not intentional. It's a chip. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, some people might like that. I don't want happy accidents. Like the, my work is very intentional, even though it's, it's pretty organic. And so I would then go, that was from using the diamond wheel. I would then go to a stone wheel. And then from a stone wheel, I would maybe go to, uh, I wouldn't use this one. That's too smooth. I would maybe go to one of the white, like, not Kratex, but it's like a Kratex, white Kratex oh, right. um, yeah. wheel, a rubber wheel, um, all wet. This is all done wet. And then from mm. there, I use tons and tons and tons of tons of sandpaper mm -hmm. in different grits. And then the final, um, I use these Scotch Bright pads. And I also will use felt wheels. This one was used for metal which is why the polishing is black, the, right. um, the silver turns the polishing uh, media black. The, when I use it for glass, it does not, it, it doesn't turn to black. Um, but I usually throw, the, I go through them and I throw them away and I start with a fresh one. But I have like, you know, tons and tons of little, little drawers of these little hard, felt wheels that I use, um, instead of using the polishing compound that jewelers use, I use something called cerium oxide, which is a loose, um, it's a loose powder that I mix with water and I it just I slowly, slowly pol polishes the, the glass. Locking. The glass I have to work with very slowly because one, one false move and it gets too hot and it cracks. Mm -hmm. I so cracked a lot of glass. All right, so Linda has a quick question, and then I'll go back to Cynthia. So Linda wants to know, is your studio a separate building from your home? No, it is the basement of my home. It's the and entire then, basement. Um, Cynthia wants to know, what training did you take to become a successful artist, and how do you price your work? Um, okay, so I went to Tyler School of Art. I started off as a photography major, and I... I uh, actually went with photography scholarships and I um, thought it would be cool to take a metals class because it was across the hall from uh, photography and I loved it. And I ended up switching my major um, my sophomore year. Um, that was the first answer. How do I price my work? Well, that's complicated because at this point, you know, not having my work be production it's hard to base it on time. Um, you know, there, there are the equations, like how much you want to get paid, how, how much materials you have in it versus how much time you spent on it. Um, I don't generally take my time into as a factor because at this point, I mean, there are some times where, you know, I might've worked on a piece for months. It, it would be priceless. I, I wouldn't be able to sell it, you know? So, you know, I, I wish I could really answer that question. I, I don't, I can't really answer that question. I like to make work and I like to sell it and then I want to make something else. So I try and price it so that it made it worth selling, made it worth making. But, you know, I really am not um, one of those people who like needs to get like the most money I possibly can for every piece. I really just want to make it and sell it so I can make something else. Well, and would you say you kind of, um, so, and to go, this kind of ties into it. So Shing is asking like how many, before pandemic, how many shows would you say you participated in a year? A lot, like 20. So the idea would be that if you kind of have a pricing structure for your work where 
you're selling it at that way. Then when you make these new pieces, you know where they're the price is going to kind of fit in because you can compare it to other pieces that you've made. I, I mean, that, I've been that, making that work for right. I've been I've been making jewelry for for like over twenty years, so I kind of know ballpark what you know what I might what people would pay for that piece, you know, and you know, it, it averages out because I have earrings, for instance, that are like my bread and butter at shows um, that are just silver. And I can like, I started doing shows. I did shows for 10 years, only selling tableware. So I can work with metal and fabricate really fast, <laughs> really, really fast because I was making things that were like this big, and now we're making things that are this big. And so it's not that I don't put the same care in it. It's just, it's almost like, you know, like this is like, you know, a detail of a piece that I had before. So it, I, can, I can work really quickly. And so I make more money and make more profit on the um, things that I make quickly that it kind of evens out that I don't overcharge for the things that I spend a lot of time on. Do you, so you have a setup, right, of some work and yes. you yes. want to show yes. us. Yeah. And so just so everyone knows, Lakota is going to put a link. Um, we have a collection of work available um, through the Peters Valley Gallery. And we have a special coupon um, for joining us. It's Meet Artist 10. We'll give you 10% off your whole online order and I think it's good till the end of April so we'll have these pieces up for a while but of course if they're gone they're gone um so you might want to check that out and we're gonna look at some work and I love I love that like how where you pair it like the work that's on the wall behind you where Thank you're you. showing that yes. photograph with the work so when I'm in my booth in, in a show I I do use things like this behind me so that you can kind of get the sense. Every single piece that I've made has, there's a, there's a, a story behind it. There's a, there was a thought behind it, obviously. I'm sure I, there's a thought behind everything anybody makes, but with my work, it, there's a specific um, inspiration. And so it kind of, people understand when they can see the pieces together. Some of them are you know, way more obvious than others. I don't know if you can see it, if it's too far away. Yeah, we Bring can kind of see it. And like, yeah, we'll see close up. On and my it, website. Like, like the textures. I love how like, right, you've got those yeah. textures that you're working and carving the glass that then are like the waves in the water or the mountain, you know, whatever you call that. <laughs> I know what that's called. Like there's like well, a glacier. Yeah, I love that. There's, um, you know, the glaciers were, when I started with the glass, um, and as I said, I mean, I'm not going to go into it too much, but I, I had a lot of, a lot of anxiety about working with plastic for so many years. And it was right around the time where, you know, the words global warming became like part of our vocabulary where it kind of wasn't before. And, um, so the icebergs and dealing with the concept of global warming, um, became a focus for me and i made a, a, a series that i continue to make that series i go back to it um and i use this is actually a photograph my dad took in iceland uh, so they you know i have a whole google drive of images my dad took at, in his various travels um but the icebergs i i tend to like follow themes of like i really like rocks i really like um water and ice and natural elements and so you know each series i have is based on a place that um i think exemplifies that this the thing you know whether it's the san andreas fault or iceland or uh volcanoes you know whatever the natural element is and i and i don't necessarily always explain that the i you know it's kind of political where I don't necessarily think it should be that global warming is real and it's a concern of mine, you know, and it started to be a concern of mine when I had a baby and I was thinking about like, you know, what, what was I leaving behind working with the material that I had been working with for as long as I had and, and the waste that was around my studio and what I was putting in the air and all of that. So 
so yeah, icebergs are, are really important, something that like I, I feel really close to, even though I obviously don't live in Alaska, you know, but I feel like that symbolizes a lot of what was going on in my head when I made the switch. So I have a question. So, and then, so, and then she has a question. Okay. So I, the way that you're displaying those, like with the photographs, mm -hmm. you, um, use those same photographs and make like a bunch of different pieces. So you might reuse those displays or do you, and do you send the display home with the person that bought the piece or you just I have, like, I have sent the display. Um, I, what these are from my outdoor shows when I sometimes when I do indoor shows I actually will print the photograph, especially if it's my photograph or my dad's I will not do it if I've if I've you know some places obviously I have not been in the world and I want to use a photograph I will not sell that photograph with the piece. Uh, it's not my photograph itself. Um, so I don't own the rights to it and I'm very conscious of that uh, most of the which is why I try and use ones that either I took or my dad took. Um, so all of these ones up here, like were ones that either he or I took. Um, and so, yeah, I would, I would be happy to give the display to somebody, but a lot of times I plan to give it as part of the thing. So I've, I've, um, printed on like a canvas or I've printed on, um, uh, aluminum or something and I make it part of the, the display goes home if somebody wants it. That's awesome. Shing actually had the same question. So if, if I didn't fully ask the question, Shing put something else in, but I think it was the same question. That's really cool. Um, yeah, like I think I, you know, some of the pieces, it makes more sense. Like they, they, they're, you know, when I, when I start the series, I'm much more literal than when I move through the series, it sometimes becomes more abstracted. And then I really, well, maybe I really like the textures. And so I'll do it in another color, um, which, takes it to a completely different place, even though I know that that was actually like the iceberg texture, it's just a pink piece of glass or something, you know. Um, so it's not as important to have the photograph there when I'm switching, mm -hmm. you know, when it's becoming more abstract, but um, but I like to, I think it's like a fun exercise for me. It keeps my brain moving too, to interpret. You know, and I don't, I don't ever wanna do something literal because I, I went to art school, I could draw this picture, I could, you know, I could carve that exact thing into the glass. I don't, I personally don't feel like that's as much of a challenge to me as kind of coming up with my own take on it, you know, what it means to me. I sometimes like I try and incorporate like, like, especially with water, I did a whole series. I don't have any of them here. I sold most of them. Um, I went to Bermuda um, a bunch of years ago with my family and, you know, a lot of the pieces were not only based on what it looked like there, but what it felt like, you know, a more visceral take on something. And so, you know, the pieces tend to be personal to me because I know what I was thinking when I made it. But um, a lot of a lot of these pieces are based on like the memory of the place for me. And so like, I, I could look at any one of them and know exactly what I was thinking, you know, which were based on places I've been versus places that I was just looking at a picture of. So. Okay, so Arlene, I'm Arlene. I'm not. You might want to put your audio on. I'm not sh quite sure um, everything that you're asking. So she wants to know about if you can tell the price of what we're seeing on the screen, including the earrings. So I don't know, Arlene, if you saw. We have a link um, that will have all the prices for the collection of work we have available through the gallery, and then if you want Deborah to show any of the pieces that she is with maybe she can hold them up, but I don't know that she can just go through and name all the prices for all of the pieces right there. Right, right. Up the top right. of her head. Like that I could not do, but I also have, I just want to point out on my website, I also include uh, videos, video close-ups of every single piece. So every single piece that I have, that I've, that I've made, that I have in stock, ready to ship, that's on my website also has a video. Okay. So, you know, if, if I don't get to it today, if it's something that you saw on their website, um, I do have close ups of things. I can't read my screen from far away. So, thing is asking if you do your own photography. And Linda, we'll put a link to her website um, for you in the chat. My own photography of my work? Yes, I do. Yeah. So, everything yeah. on the website, you, you're doing all that photography. I am. I also, 
do photography for other people on the side, other other jewelers. Um, I, I shoot my husband's work. I, I do other, I will shoot other artists. As I said, I started off thinking I was gonna be a photographer. And so the tie in to me, um, and you know, as I've been doing, I've been making jewelry for 20 uh, more than that years. Um, I feel like when Instagram started and I started to think about how I was representing my work and how I was presenting my work to the outside world, the photography part of it kind of clicked together with the jewelry making. Because if you go through my Instagram or you go through my website, I try and think about how I'm presenting each piece I don't know if I'm artic. I, I'm better at presenting it than yeah, I am. Yeah, well, it's yeah, it's it. like the same idea, right? Because you're right when you're doing a show, you're you're like selling your work in person and you're showing people, and it's all very tactile. And so right. it's also verbal because you can talk about your work and tell the story about each piece. When then you're moving into the digital space, you've got to use those photographs, your description, exactly. whatever you exactly. present it, to kind of replace that. Think those things that you do in person. I actually feel like I'm better at doing it that way. At this, I'm better at like I sit in a basement by myself 90% of the time. So I feel like words don't aren't. I know I'm like really chatty and I, I will talk about anything, but I feel like I articulate myself better through my work, through the photography, through the like visual representation of my work than I do even describing it, mm. which is, you know. I'm much more comfortable visually than I am. I feel like, you know, I'm, I, I can be a little awkward. You know, I, I lose, <laughs> I lose words. <laughs> <laughs> um, Arlene wants to know, do the earrings have weight? Are they lightweight? You know, the earrings are not weightless, but I, as I make them, I use a gram scale. And so I know, for me, what my comfortable range of earring weight is. And I, as I'm making each piece, I weigh them so that I know I could wear my own work um, long term. I'm just going to, sorry, I got a message on my screen. Um, so they all weigh around nine grams. For me, that's like, that's the max weight that I can wear comfortably. And so they're not weightless. But I, I feel, you know, and I, I sell them. So I know from my customers, you know, what I kind of figured out the comfort zone. So, you know, maybe uh, like a necklace, I can make a more hefty piece of glass. Um, you can see on the earrings, I, I keep the, the glass much more shallow. And that's because I'm, I'm conscious of the, of the weight. So this is. This is one of well, the, the thing about weighted, I make, my, you know, I have a whole line of, of one of a kind jewelry pieces that are also like have weight to them. And I, you know, it's like, you notice, sure. When you first put it on, you might feel that. And then your body, everything adjusts to it. And so two hours, four hours, eight hours later, you kind of forget that you're wearing it. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you initially put it on your, you're conscious of the weight. I, I feel like we tend to. I also do a lot with, um, like where I place the, the post or, you know, I'm, I'm very conscious of trying things on and making sure they're all wearable, you know, taking it on test drive, wearing it around my studio for a day to make sure it's something that, you know, I don't want to put something out into the world that isn't functional. So uh, I am very conscious of that. So no, they're not weightless, but yes, they're all wearable. How do you form the wavy silver pieces? Well, I'm a silversmith, and so I use hammers, and um, I have a little anvil, and I have lots of stakes. You can you can kind of see I have. Um, I'm, I'll bring you to a, an area of my studio that you have not been. Um, I have this big work table that has a, a pipe vise attached to it. You can you can see. So I use. You're kind lots of, of moving it to manually wake, make those waves. You're not putting it into like a pre oh no no I, I fabricate it. No, I have a hydraulic press um, that I, I guess I could use for something like that. I could make a mold. Um, I, you could see how dusty that hydraulic press is. I haven't used it in years. You can give it to me. <laughs> you can 
take it. Um, I have, I tend to do things, you know, I, I don't want the pieces to have the same, you know, even the, 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 um, the shapes of the metal. I mean, I, I have consistent um, shapes that I go back to, but they're all different. They're all hand cut, they're all hand fabricated. So every, every single pair is different. Well, it also sounds like you enjoy, right? Like a metal, I do. you enjoy that process of bangy metal, right? Shaping metal, like that, that whole process. I think you, you just I want to do, do it. You know, if you, I don't necessarily do I have any pieces out, just like one half a purse that I, you know, was in the middle of making when I made a transition. Um, I started off making big, giant things, teapots and you know, my smallest things that I made were little baby spoons, but they were all hand hammered. And those pieces took so many hours of, of labor that I know other jewelers think that this is really labor intensive, but if you spend say 10 years making teapots, this is nothing, you know, this is like minuscule. And so that was great training <laughs> for making really fast jewelry because it was so big and cumbersome. It took so much thought on how even just to hold things um, that now I do things really, really quickly. Shing's asking, do you work in um, Ar Argentium silver, sterling silver, or fine silver, or all of them? I don't work in Argentium. Um, I tried to work with Argentium. It has a fragility about it um, that I didn't like. And on top of it, it didn't not patina. It did patina. It just got a different patina. It didn't turn black, but it would get like this hazy white, which I thought was even harder for people to clean. Mm. Whereas silver has been around since like, you know, I don't know, the Romans, the Egyptians, you know, like I kind of feel like it works. <laughs> so it's cleanable. You know, I, there's no pieces that I make that are impossible to clean. So I just don't, I don't do Argentium. The fine silver, I do use fine silver. Um, sometimes I will do a fine silver bezel. If I'm working with a very delicate piece of glass, I will use a fine silver bezel as opposed to a sterling bezel, only because I have been known to um, make the bezel so tight that the glass like literally cracks from the tension. So Arlene, um, another Arlene, Arlene Rubin is asking, would you sell the gorgeous piece you are wearing and how much is it? I would. This is actually one of my newest pieces. I have no idea how much it is. Um, I honestly, uh, I would have to look at my website. That's something I could easily pull up um, when I'm not on Zoom. But yes, this piece is one of my newest pieces. This is from um, this, this I made very recently during, during the whole COVID shutdown. Um, I did a series based on coral reefs, which um, I did not use images that I took. I actually um, hit a wall at some point during the lockdown phase of our lives. And I would go on YouTube and I would watch these like uh, videos of fish. <laughs> found them very calming and it kind of like spun into uh, like oh you know like I think I'm going to make this reef series which also kind of fits the theme of my work because you know coral reefs are dying and it's another issue but really it came because I just really liked watching these little fish go through the anemone and <laughs> it's just like <laughs> it's very very calming and you could really fall through a rabbit hole watching YouTube videos <laughs> Mm -hmm. And so I would just sit on my phone and, and like look at coral reefs and scuba divers. Oh, and it, there was, it was right around the time that that um, video on Netflix came out, My Octopus Teacher, which I, everyone should watch. It was really a great video, a great movie, but it was very soothing. And so, um, you know, we were cooped up and I was having, a, you know, a lot of like, where is this going anxiety. And so this is, this is based on... Um, there was a video that I watched of a uh, green sea turtle. I'm gonna go closer to the screen. And um, so this was loosely based on, which I then researched green sea turtles. I fell down a little rabbit hole of green sea turtles. And they're 
it, their good luck in uh, the Hawaiian culture. They're called Hanu. Um, and they wear like a little, I'm sure you've seen them. People come back from Hawaii with like those little sea turtle pendants and stuff. I didn't want to do anything literal, but I just loved that I was like so enamored by these sea turtles. And then it turns out that they're actually like, it, uh, there's a, a whole thought behind, you know, the turtles themselves that kind of spun into a thing. So yes, this is on my website. Uh, Lakota, I asked Lakota, she's going to try to find a link to that piece so we can get yeah, you This is called, I think it's called the green Hanu pendant, but I might be wrong about the green part, but it's definitely called a Hanu pendant. Well, I found your website very easy to navigate because I was going in uh, matching the images with the pieces. So everyone should well, have a you. time shopping. Um, thank you. Well, you know I, what? It's, <laughs> I've worked really hard on making the website as easy as I could. It, it, through this year, this lockdown, I have redone my website like four times. Every time I think, you know, when I find figure something else out, I'm like, oh, and I redo it. So, you know, yeah, you kind glass. of have it like color, right? Like you have like with mm -hmm. glass, without glass, and then you, you kind of have it in like a color order, which right. I think presents really nicely. Thank you. So I wanted to ask about like, you have this um, certain texture, right? Like even on the waves, there's a a texture on top versus like a polished finish okay. and you you tend to use that texture a lot and I didn't know if there was Julia found it it's 715 dollars for that turtle so this, I'm just gonna show you that you know, I'm gonna bring the light over so you can see the are you talking about the like the sides the of the bezel yeah like I think it's the so, oh the size of the bezel okay yeah so the size of the bezel are the texture that the diamond wheels that I use for the um, for carving the glass? That is what the texture it gives mm. on the silver. And I started to do that because I think it kind of ties it all together. Yeah. As opposed to using, I kind of thought that the unmatted bezel was distracting. Yeah. Yeah, I think it works really nicely. And and it, like it and was even with the super waves distracting. Like, Cuz I think yeah, what like a lot of the ways right if it was like super shiny and almost yeah, be distracting exactly. 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 So and you so, can like and it kind of like ties it, it together. Yeah. 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 I think it works. Very cool. Um do you have photos of your silverware that you made in the past? I do. Um there's a few pieces on my website I believe I just put them up for I have I still have some collectors that um hold on I'm just gonna I, I'm just gonna go over here I have I found like when I went through stuff I'm just gonna I have old old business cards Ooh, I'm, I'm just I'm just gonna show you this was a, a baby spoon and cup set I don't know if you can see it oh yeah Nice. And those are like an acrylic handle. The handles were acrylic. And then this was some of the acrylic. Mm. I did a lot of Judaica and baby spoons. What year were they made? Ooh. I started doing shows in 1997 and I stopped doing the acrylic in, I want to say 2004 six ish no 2009 my son was born in 2009 so i'm just looking through here oh here are salad servers this is this one was a, a very crumply but you can see that these are salad servers mm. with acrylic but i i made like oh here this this was from what year was this what year was this this was 2000 and I don't know 2010 and you can see this is it. I went through a phase of making handbags mm. and this was a, a brooch that came off the handbag oh nice so I mean this this is big you know it fit your phone oh and here look these are this one was from 2008 and this is uh sugar and creamer so like I said after you after you work like big giant things making little stuff 
becomes kind of fast. So I actually I like the I like the aspect of making. You know, that's that's why I became a maker because I like to make stuff. Um, but you know, some people are concerned with making it making things really fast. I, I actually like the process. I, there's something cathartic about taking something from start to finish and, and having a unique piece each time that I, I actually really enjoy. Awesome. I don't know if anybody else has questions. We're, we are over 12, but um, we can hang around a couple more minutes if people have more questions or want to see any of those pieces close oh, up. Yeah, I've got how they wear on the body. Pieces, um, I'm welcome. To you know, mm -hmm. if there's something on the website that you see that you want to. Do you ever sell at the Museum of Art and Design in New York? Uh, I have not. They have not uh, ever approached me, but I have sold at other museums. I sell at the museum in, in, in Corning in New York, and I sold a, uh, the, a long time ago, the Museum of Women in the Arts. Um, I've sold at numerous museums, just no, the one in New York don't, hasn't, uh, hasn't happened. You're missing out. <laughs> They're missing out. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. They're missing out. Yeah. yeah. Um, please show the rainbow necklace. The rainbow necklace. Is there Maureen, one? I'm not that sure I... which necklace. Are you looking on a like one of these in the in the back? Is that Maureen, what you're you talking about? Put your audio on. Like, is this is that the one you're talking sure. about? The one in the middle. Was this the one in the middle? This one? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So this is that's gorgeous. Is that like it's like a bubble series that you have, it's right? Part of my bubble series, yeah. So I'm gonna move my light forward just so that you can see. And how big is the ring? Uh it's approximately, I'm just gonna move this to the back. It's approximately 18 inches. Now I can always alter it if it's too big or too small. Um, but it I was just wondering before I do that. Um I use a lot of these tension clasps. I find um, really easy to do, and people who have uh, arthritis or you know whatever, everybody can do those. It's very simple, Absolutely. and then it just fits. Yeah, you can see my chain from the necklace. And so oh, when I, I Lorraine, I know Lorraine. <laughs> <laughs> when I work, I actually use. Um, I have like these little mannequins all over my studio, and so I, as I'm working. I have a, a, a steel mannequin that I use that I can actually form the metal onto, but um, I go between myself and you can actually see how dirty this mannequin um, is because I will, I work right on them. Um, Randy wants to know if you can show the Valley of Fire necklace and yeah. Marie it says that she owns four pairs of your new unique earrings and one necklace and they're so much oh, more yeah. beautiful hey. now that she's watched your zoom oh so this is a valley of fire this is actually a place that i have been and so it my, my dad took this picture i'm just gonna bring it over to you so you can see so um i don't know if you've ever been there it is um right outside of las vegas and you could you could take a day trip from vegas and go see the valley of fire it's it's really it's crazy um, all the rocks and the, the blue sky and like the different textures of the, the stones. And so I used a raw garnet. Um, this is a garnet that was found in Utah. Um, I did not find it myself. I got it at a gem show, but I just loved it. I'm just I'm gonna, ah, waiting with the light. I just want there to be enough light that you can see the texture of the, oh, yeah. the, the, the stone. So I also do some of my own lapidary work because the, the gemstones work a lot, very similar to working with glass. And so I can also use that diamond saw to cut stones and I use the, um, the diamond wheels to shape gemstones. So this is one of the stones that, that I did a, some work on to shape it the way that I wanted to work with it. Oh, and this has an interesting clasp. 
this has a, I'm not wearing my glasses. I'm sorry, I'm a little blind. You didn't really touch on this earlier and somebody was asking if you like gemstones or glass, but you pair them together a lot. And do you start do. with the glass and then bring the gemstones in or do you, do you bring them together in a different way? You know, like I don't know design? that. I don't know that I have like one specific way that I work. You know, I'm, I'm telling a story and what I usually do when I start a tray for a series, first of all, I always start with the drawing. Like every piece starts with drawings, but then I also will go into, before I work with like the finished product glass, I will take raw sheets of glass and just play with textures. And I also have like lots of like sheets of um, window glass that I've just bought at the hardware store that I played with textures and made texture samples and um, different samples of cuts and shapes and things just so I have like, I don't want to wait. The glass that I use, um, the optical glass is really expensive. It's made with uh, platinum in the melting process. So it's really um, has a lot of refraction and lets the light in. It's, it's beautiful material. I'm, I'm all wound up, but, um, but it's expensive. And so I, you know, my pr part of my process is then I'm gonna bring you back over to some one of my trays that I abandoned. You're gonna have to I go back after because someone does want to ask about a necklace. Okay. But. You can see that um, like I, I kind of like gather all the things mm -hmm. like that might tell the story of this. There's one tray that I have that would uh, see this is a problem when I clean my studio, but I don't know where I put it. <laughs> but I I um yeah, I don't know where I put it. But I will find like all the stones, like it's like for Valley of Fire. I was like, okay, I know garnets are gonna be play a big role in this piece. So mm -hmm. I went around my studio and I went through every drawer and I found all the garnets that I thought would work. And then I kind of narrow it down, mm -hmm. narrow it down. And then I kind of, you know, then I'll, and I'll go back and forth between my drawing. And sometimes it, it, it evolves as I go. Like I always marvel at people um, who only design on paper and then do exactly the exact design that they design on paper. Mine always changes and evolves when I'm when it's three dimensions. Like sometimes it's like, oh, if I flipped it backwards or if I flipped it upside down, it's actually even more interesting. Or, you know, I never know until I actually get those pieces in my hand, but I do start with the concept and the idea, you know, a very specific thought process. So, you know, it's hard to answer. Do I start with the stones? Do I start with the, um, the glass? It's like a combination. Yeah, Judy says she really designs on paper. Well, I did the same thing that you were saying. And I, I did, I had an idea for this piece like to start and I painted this whole thing and now I've rotated it and I'm thinking it works better like the other way, you know, so I get it. That like, happens all the time. Good. I think, but I think that's good to be able to change and you're just, because you want your ideas to like evolve and deepen, right? You like start with right. an inspiration. And so you start going with that and then you get more inspired as you go. Um, so our, Adele did ask this, the impact uh, pendant necklace that's on your website. If you is can- it the pink? Is it, is it, it. Is it, I have a, I, this is from a whole series um, of impact. So I'm, I'm, is it this one? On, I'll look at her link. What um, color is it? it? It wasn't that one. I did pull it up one? on your website. Um, it's- What color is it? Let me see. It has a natural rough amethyst and white topaz. Uh oh. Yeah, it's like a larger. It has amethyst. Is it what? What color yeah, is the like glass? It's a druzy kind of amethyst, like a rough. Um, the glass is kind of like a watermelony color. It's like green and okay. and pink and yellowish. Okay. I just I sort my work by color, so it helps to. Uh... Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just gonna plug my phone in while I'm, I just got a little message that my phone was going to die and I don't see where I put my, um, maybe it's over here. Oh, here, <laughs> it's right here. Uh, I just wanna plug it in before it. Yeah, that, the Zoom will suck up all your battery fast. <laughs> yeah, 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 there we go. I just wanted to, oh! Don't worry, Adele. She's happy to show you. She just has plugging to plug in. in her collection. I'm just plugging in so that we don't die. So let me just move stuff. 
stuff around. I have a lot of work. And I'm not exactly sure what piece I'm looking for. So it's like, well, on your website, when it's like facing in that orientation on the right side is this at like a rough amethyst. So it's got that kind of druzy, like, you know, rough, rough rock. And then yeah. on the left side, it's got this kind of watermelon -y, um, color. Let's see. It's a lovely piece. I like it. Is it this piece? It might be this one. I like this piece a lot too. Let's see. Is it this one? Yes, I think that's it. Yes. Yes. So yes. this this piece, and why it was hard for me to figure out which piece is because I have a whole series that I is from like an impact series, and I don't. There was a couple of years ago where scientists were talking about this meteorite that was going to hit the earth or something and um i love geology i a lot of my pieces are based on like canyons and you know all of that obviously you know is from an impact and so it kind of got me thinking about the materials that i work with and how i work with the two materials and putting them together it, it just kind of became the impact series so the idea behind it was like big rough stones that I'm then going to impact the glass into. Mm. So, so just so that you know why I could not figure out which one it was. So this, yeah, this one has much more subtle colors, almost like watercolor. And then it has a nice big veil so that you can put any chain through it. And I sign and copyright and mark every piece on the back. I, I sign every piece. So I don't know if you can see it because it's so shiny, but you can kind of okay. see my my signature on the back. Awesome. I have a question. Sorry, Brian, to interrupt. Go I got a question that was actually a, a direct message. So I don't think you saw it. Um, but Linda is wondering, do you need to have extra home insurance on your home for your studio? Uh, I do. I do have extra home insurance. And I also am very, very conscious that I work in my home that um, I drag my acetylene and oxygen tanks. We have a breezeway. I don't leave them down here. I'm very, I'm pretty paranoid. I also have every single, um, every single outlet I have attached to a light. So when I leave my studio, if the lights aren't out, I know something's on. Very smart. Because I'm paranoid. That's my little safety. Like if there's a light, then something's on. Because so every single outlet has a light attached to it in some way, in some capacity. But yeah, I do have extra homeowners insurance. Brilliant. Shing says that's brilliant. <laughs> it's called paranoia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So any other questions? Uh, now's your chance to ask. We'll probably wrap this up in the next few minutes. No, but if anybody, if, if anybody looks through my website and sees something that we didn't talk about, you're welcome to uh, contact me. But I also have videos on the um, the website because I know my work needs to be seen in um, multiple directions like you can't just it doesn't just present in one um, in, in one view you know so I do have the videos so you can see all the different hues in, of color in each um, in each piece and you know all the different facets to it. Um, Arlene is asking do you wear a mask when you work? Yes I do I wear a whole mask glasses apron you find gloves. even with the glass with that thing that like protects the dust do you still does it still get all over you or it's really good about keeping it all with the vacuum and the shield that well has. the glass is wet when i'm working with it mm -hmm. also so right. you know theoretically there should not be so much dust the dust in the glass is when it's dry and you can actually see um, where it splattered that when it dries, it gets white. When I'm working with it, there's no, there, it's not necessarily kicking dust up. Um, it is a, a fear of mine because there is something called silica, sil, 
silicosis, sil something like that. Um, silicosis that um, is really, you know, could be fatal. So a lot of a lot of uh, ceramic artists have that problem. You know, every every art form has some aspect of it that's kind of toxic. You just have to be really, you know, aware of what you're working with. Um, oh, Renee's so feeling hopes that in-person shows start up sooner. We I hope so too, but you know what? One thing I, that I've actually, and we were talking about this before the Zoom, um, Brianna and I, um, that I actually don't mind not traveling so much. It's, it's, I hope that in-person shows start so that I can, you know, interact with people, but I've actually become more comfortable interacting with people from my studio and on Zoom, I have, you know, several customers that I Zoom with and, um, you know, will show the new work and, you know, I, it's, it's okay. I feel like, you know, we're, it's forced me to grow in other ways. So yeah. I think customers don't always realize how much work and money goes into an artist having yeah. a booth at a show. It's all the traveling and then like the actual physical like labor mm -hmm. of like putting up the booth and then being there. And so it's, I think it's so rewarding, yeah. right? Because we all want to share our work and talk about our work and interact with people. And so that like, you, you kind of forget about all that hassle and money because you want to do that. But um, right. kind of this time you, you're now like reevaluating that a little bit it's a it's a lot i mean it's it's i won't even go into it but it's yeah setting up a booth just driving to you know every aspect of it has to be really well thought out when you're doing it because you know you only have so much room in your suitcase there's only so much you can bring and so yeah I, i'm gonna be very Alice rusty you, when we you miss start. the artist camaraderie and she's absolutely right i about do that. i do that part i miss um terribly you know it's lonely. We all live in our own little like studio alone. So yeah, that part of it I do miss. And I miss like, go ahead. No, but I miss um, you know, the part of interacting with customers it that's hard to not have is the feedback. Mm -hmm. Um what what people like, what they don't like is important to me because it helps me grow. You know, all of these years, I, I obviously don't like when people say nasty things, which, you know, but the, even the negative comments, sometimes it, it helps you grow. So, you know, it's hard, it's hard to grow in a vacuum. Denise Marie says, I miss the social interaction too, but this has been wonderful. And, oh, uh, and I'll tell you all, this for is coming why we did for Peter's Valley. We had this um, virtual craft fair and we're going to have one in the spring that's on this um hop-in platform which is can be a little cumbersome but we did have like practice sessions where all the artists got to like get together and hang out and then you know having it so that you can interact because it is nice right we do miss all those things and um mm -hmm. yeah so any other questions before we depart today last chance and I hope you'll all join us next week. Um, I don't know if you can see my scarf, but this is by Gina Panorfi and she is going to be our art. Oh no, I'm wrong. I'm off a week. Oh goodness. No, next week we're joined by a glass artist, um, Jake Pfeiffer of Hot Glass Alley. So Gina Panorfi, I think is the week after that. I was thinking she was next week because she was actually on top of things and got her inventory to us already. So um, <laughs> check our calendar. We'll also send out emails. I think I'm getting the order right, but I could be wrong. Um, but I'm pretty sure. Thank everybody for coming. I really, you know, I, I do thank everybody for taking time out of their, their lives to come into my studio today. So thank you. Thanks. Cool. Well, have I a good did. day, everybody, and hopefully we'll see you next week. And you can shop right. on Deborah's website or on our collection as well and reach out if you have any questions. All right. Take care. Bye -bye. Linda. Thank you. Linda. Linda. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in. We would like to thank our sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to receive more like it in the future.